Saturday, July 27th. Today in Europe, new and intensified German air raids have been reported over England, Scotland, and Wales. Continued rumors are heard of new peace gestures by Adolf Hitler, forwarded through neutral countries. But Britain says that her answer is no peace with Hitler. And the British today are calling another 300,000 men to the colors. Now the news from Europe direct. Berlin, London, and Rome. First, for the report from the German capital. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. The strange lull in this war continues. People keep wondering when the attack on Britain will get underway. But no one knows. Most Germans you talk to are deadly sure that the war will be over before the winter sets in. After what happened to France, they're confident of the next phase. The newspapers make as much as possible of the air attacks on Britain, and especially on British shipping in the Channel. Yesterday, for a change, German motor torpedo boats carried out an attack on British shipping near Brighton. A special war communique came out late last evening, claiming that 34,000 tons of shipping had been sunk in this speedboat raid. The Turkish Bilbacher claims this morning that the Germans have sunk 100,000 tons of enemy shipping in the last two days alone. But of course, all of this is merely skirmishing. The real war with Britain, as realized, has not begun. Probably we must wait another 10 days at least, perhaps longer. In the meantime, Germany is consolidating its position in the Balkans and giving the governments in Southeastern Europe their first inkling of the kind of new order which Germany expects to set up if and when the war is won. Recently, the Hungarian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister journeyed to Munich to see her Hitler about the matter. Hungary, of course, wants Transylvania back from Romania. But the German course is that such matters as this can wait until the war's end. Yesterday, it was the turn of the Romanians who have swung so quickly into the German camp since the collapse of France. The Romanian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister arrived in Salzburg yesterday, had a talk with Herr Hitler and Herr von Ribbentrop over the new order, and left last night for Rome to hear Mussolini's ideas on the same subject. The Romanian Minister is quoted in the German press today as stating that the foreign policy of his land has taken a new turn. Bucharest's attitude towards Britain is shown in dispatches today would say that as a reprisal for the seizure by the British of three Romanian ships at Port Said, the Romanians have confiscated 18 British tugs on the Danube. Romania is also turning against its former ally, France. Several French oil experts and directors of Franco-Romanian oil companies, as reported, have just been expelled from Romania. Following the Romanians come the Bulgarians, who arrived today for talks with Herr Hitler and Herr von Ribbentrop. Tomorrow, the Slovaks arrive. Dr. Tiso, their president, and Dr. Tuko, the Tukar, the foreign minister. All roads on the continent now lead to Berlin, or wherever Herr Hitler and his foreign minister happen to be. And Germany, naturally, is taking advantage of its new position as a dominant power on the continent. Incidentally, I noticed by the photographs that the Romanian statesmen wore uniforms when they arrived in Salzburg yesterday, just as do the Germans and Italians. It seems to be the new mode in Europe for the civilian statesmen. The Slovaks wear uniforms, too, on state visits. While the war effort lags, the press here gives a lot of attention to the opening of Munich today of the exhibition of German art, an annual affair. Dr. Goebbels opened it this morning with a broadcast speech. Only one enemy remains, said the propaganda minister, and no one doubts who will win in the end. A German nation, he went on, is in its entirety a fighting nation. Herr Hess, Hitler's deputy, opened the exhibition in the name of the Fuhrer, saying, quote, I greet him as the protector of German culture, unquote. The theme of war dominates this exhibition of German art. There are paintings of the grim bombardment of Warsaw by heavy German artillery, and I notice one painting entitled Bombardment of the Westerplatte, and it shows the German battleship Schleswig Holstein firing point blank into this little island by Danzig, where the Poles defended themselves against overpowering odds so valiantly. There is a whole room devoted to paintings of the Polish war and three to the war in the West. It's announced in Berlin today that on the orders of Herr Himmler, 
chief of the secret police, a police land worker has been hanged. The charge is stated to be immoral conduct. I return you now to CBS in New York. That was William Al Shira reporting from Berlin. Here's the latest news from the Balkans. Today at Salzburg, Austria, important talks are to take place between German and Romanian officials. Romanian Premier Gigartu and Foreign Minister Manolescu meet in a few hours with Nazi Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop. And later today, the Romanian pair are to see Adolf Hitler. Now the news from the British capital, reported by Edward R. Murrow. Go ahead, London. This is London. We were told last night how the narrow reaches of the English Channel were crisscrossed. Of the smallest units in the German and British navies. A German squadron of torpedo boats attempted to sink a British convoy. The nine Nazi speed boats encountered two British motor boats, aided by two destroyers. The engagement lasted 15 minutes until the German motor boats threw up a smoke screen and fled to the French coast. These deadly little naval craft are designed to dart in, fire their torpedoes, and then speed away before the deck guns can be brought to bear on them. And the British motor boat resembles an ordinary speed boat. They're 70 feet long, mount two torpedoes and heavy machine guns. The crews are protected against heavy seas by padded ceilings and rubber cushioned floors. They carry a crew of nine. The German torpedo boats are longer, about twice as heavy and somewhat slower. Their top speed is about 44 miles an hour compared to the British 52. They resemble a slender tugboat and carry 17 men. They're probably more seaworthy than the British craft and are able to operate from the fjords of Norway. The British Isles got small attention from the German Air Force last night. A few bombs were dropped at isolated points. One raider was knocked down. Towns in southwest England and Wales were bombed this morning, but no details are available. Romania seems to be leading in the matter of seizing ships. According to latest reports, the British authorities at Port Said have seized three Romanian vessels, one freighter and two large tankers. But the Romanians have seized 20 British oil barges on the Danube. British correspondents in Bucharest predict that there will be further reprisals against British vessels on the Danube. Britain can do little to influence the outcome of the Balkans poker game now in progress. But it is believed here that the showdown is likely to occur in the immediate future. British correspondents report the most intensive Russian propaganda campaign in the Balkan countries for 20 years. The main question seems to be whether Moscow will limit its action to diplomatic pressure, propaganda, and intimidation. Some British correspondents in the Balkans are hopefully asserting that the Russian trade mission now on its way to Yugoslavia is in reality a military mission, trying to set up an alliance between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. While the war against Britain is confined to the air action, mainly against British convoys, interest in the war that seems far away, the war in the Middle East, is increasing. While it's generally agreed that the British Navy has lived up to its reputation in the Mediterranean, there is some concern about the land fighting. There has been no important change in the strategic position as a result of the action between British and Italian troops. But the Italians have the initiative. And it is felt that their local successes may influence the attitude of the native populations. Commander King Hall, in his weekly newsletter, deprecates the manner in which the British public was told of the capture of Kassala by the Italians. He says the news, as given out here, suggested that it was a mere outpost of no importance and that its occupation by the Italians was part of the British plan. Kassala is a large and important town, the headquarters of a province, and the central market of an important agricultural district. It's on the railway between Port Sudan and the Blue Nile, and its capture by the Italians may have some important possibilities if the Italians decide to launch a concentric attack on the Nile Valley. The latest German achievement reported in London tells of their capture of another army leader. This time, Colonel Mary Booth, chief of the Salvation Army in Belgium. She is reported to be interned at Constance near the Swiss frontier. The House of Commons is scheduled to discuss foreign policy in a secret session on Tuesday. There is a feeling amongst many members that too many secret sessions are being held. The House guards jealously its right to question and criticize ministers and policies and has no desire for the business of secret sessions to become a habit. Sir Kingsley Wood's new budget is still the target for criticism. This morning's Daily Mail, Daily Express asks, where's all the money to come from to pay for the war? It's not coming out of this new budget. Lord Beaverbrook's paper then proposes two methods of increasing the government's revenue. The first is to levy more income tax on the people whose incomes range from $800 to $2,000 a year. And the second 
is a flat capital levy of 10% on all fortunes. And the British Red Cross raised a little money in an unusual way yesterday. A chicken was killed by machine gun bullets fired in a fight between German and British aircraft. The owner auctioned it off for $40 and gave the proceeds to the Red Cross. I return you now to CBS in New York. That was Edward R. Murrow reporting from London. This morning in Rome, it was announced that the American ambassador, William Phillips, is leaving Italy for the United States Monday to confer with President Roosevelt. Now the latest news from the Italian capital, reported by Cecil Brown. Go ahead, Rome. Uh, hello, hello, CB. Hello, uh, As I informed you before, Cecil Brown is unable to come to the studios this morning. So we return you to CBS in New York. You've just heard the announcement, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Brown is unable to uh, arrive at the studios this morning to bring you the latest news report from Rome. We have here a dispatch which says the Italian planes violently bombed the British naval base at Malta during the night. This comes from a high command communique. Rome also reports that Italian planes bombarded Gibraltar last night for the second straight night. The bombardment was described as violent. And from Spain, it is reported that Italian airplanes, which raided Gibraltar yesterday and last night, killed four persons and injured 50. The planes attacked in the morning, but were driven off before they could drop their bombs. The planes returned in the evening, however, and dumped bombs on the fortress and harbor. Premier Mussolini, who celebrates his 57th birthday Monday, showed foreign correspondents today how he is keeping fit. Receiving 45 foreign correspondents at his riding ring at the Via Colonia, Mussolini went through early morning exercises during which he rode his horse over 19 hurdles, including one five feet two inches high. On the highest hurdle, one of two cavalrymen who followed Mussolini, knocked down the top bar, but Mussolini cleared it easily. After completing the jump, Mussolini, wearing cavalry boots, riding breeches, and a sleeveless white jersey, which contrasted with his bare brown arms, rode up to the correspondent and, speaking in German, said, Am I sick? Am I tired? Then he smiled and galloped off. Before he took the jump, Mussolini mounted on a German cavalry horse named Taina from Hanover greeted the correspondents one by one as Press Minister Alessandro Povolini presented us. It was the first time in three and a half years that Mussolini had received newspaper men. Colonel Camillo Rodolfi, who is riding master and fencing instructor, always accompanies Mussolini on such exercises, told me afterward, Il Ducci does this every morning. Instead of coffee, he takes these early morning jumps. He likes plenty of exercise and very little to eat or drink. Being a vegetarian, he eats only soup and vegetables, mostly greens, and never touches meat. Official German news agency reported from Tallinn, Estonia today that the Minister of Commerce there had returned from a two-week visit to Moscow and announced that in the future, all Estonian industry would obtain raw materials from Russia. Estonia and other Baltic countries recently applied to Russia for permission to become autonomous Soviet republics under the Russian Soviet. At the same time... The Tallinn newspaper, Ravellet, reported that 103 banks and almost 500 factories in various industries would be nationalized immediately. At Havana, the 21 American republics virtually have adopted a Declaration of Havana, regulating the future of orphaned European colonies in the Western Hemisphere. The Declaration is expected to reiterate that the New World remains isolated from the wars of the old and will not tolerate political or economic inroads by Nazis, fascists, or communists. The 21 American republics are expected to declare flatly that new world territory must not be transferred from one old world power to another. The declaration, insofar as it affects British, French, and Dutch colonies in America, is a compromise between the original United States plan and the attitude of Argentina. The United States wanted to establish a collective trusteeship over the possessions, a sort of hemispheric mandate. And with these press association dispatches, we bring to a close this morning's report of European development, which comes to you each morning at this time and each evening at 6.45 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. This morning you heard William L. Shirer reporting from Berlin, Edward R. Murrow from London. Your announcer, Larry Elliott. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>